From April 1939 to March 1943, 185 refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe found a safe haven at Scattergood, a temporary hostel in what had been a Quaker boarding school near West Branch, Iowa. With the help of the Quaker farmers and idealistic college students who took them in, the refugees, referred to as guests by staff, sought to overcome the trauma of their experiences in Europe, find a niche for themselves, and build new lives in the new world. The Story of Scattergood. For the 1939 residents of West Branch, Iowa, this gravel lane served as the main route into town. But to European refugees trying to escape Hitler's tyranny, the dusty Iowa road was a path to safety. Basically, we're talking about Schindler's List on the prairie. The only difference is, is that everyone in the world knows about Oskar Schindler and the 1,100 Jews he saved in Middle Europe. Almost no one knows about the 185 refugees that Iowa Quaker farmers and college kids saved. From 1939 to 1943, nearly 200 refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe found a safe haven at Scattergood Hostel, a makeshift commune on the site of what had been a Quaker boarding school. Here, outside the small town of West Branch, Iowa Quakers hosted Jews as well as Hitler's political dissidents, offering them food, shelter, and a glimmer of light in the midst of Nazi darkness. Admittedly, 185 is a drop well, it's not even a drop in the bucket compared to six million people who perished at Auschwitz and Treblinka and all the other death camps. But 185 souls saved was more than what was being saved down the road. I mean, this story is a story, a remarkable story, of Iowa Quaker farmers and college students who had no connection with these people, had no obligation, and in many cases couldn't even correctly pronounce their names, but brought them over from Berlin and Prague and Vienna and Budapest and saved their lives. If the Quakers had not saved them, they would have all been killed at Auschwitz and gone up the chimney as ashes. But because of the bravery of some people, their lives were saved. People pretty much like you, actually. For author Michael Lewitt Trams, the Scattergood story is an example of goodness during a time of hatred, a rarity in world history he feels compelled to share with everyone he can, from Quaker congregations to these Des Moines high school students. If you were a refugee, where would you go? Where would you find help? Who would help you? Most people don't do anything in most uh, areas of their lives to actively, ongoingly help someone else. You know, life as hard as it is, we don't want to be responsible or feel responsible for somebody else, so we turn the other way. Well, during the Third Reich, most people ignored these peoples who were trying to scurry out of harm's way. What's amazing is that the Iowa Quakers didn't like with getting to know a person, the more that you get to know about Scattergood Hostel, the more you realize this is exciting, this is life changing. If I involve myself in this, if I invest my, my heart, not just my head, but my heart in this story, it will change me. For Michael, pictures of Scattergood offer a glimpse into just how unique the hostel really was. In fact, you'd swear these to be snapshots of a peaceful family farm rather than images of a wartime refugee camp. Unlike most service agencies, which offered limited assistance during business hours only, Scattergood operated as a full-time commune, with each refugee staying an average of four months. Here, Quakers and Jews not only shared field work and daily chores, but also the tremendous burden of war's impact. Some of the people had been through great trauma. Some had known hunger, had been beaten. Some had been in Dachau. Another refugee would come down to the pantry at night and steal lard. He had known severe hunger in a camp and just eat lard to regain weight and to satisfy his hunger. But by that point, the hunger probably wasn't just physi physiological, it was also psychological. Some of the refugees arrived with children or spouses still back in Europe. Some of them would pace the hallway at night when they couldn't sleep, back and forth, back and forth. None of these 
49 volunteers had had any training. They didn't know what post-traumatic syndrome was. They hadn't been instructed in psychology or in counseling, and yet they came and gave what they had the most of, which was vitality and enthusiasm, idealism, and love. On a practical level, that love meant, I'm going to listen to your story even when I'm tired and I have five other things distracting me. Love means that when you're hurting, I'm strong enough to ask you what you're hurting about and we'll re really listen to the answer. There's something that all of us could do to help out the life of someone. While Quaker representatives in Europe helped refugees secure immediate needs like visas and passage money, Iowa Quakers, with their modest resources, channeled efforts into long-reaching acts of human kindness, opening their homes to the war-torn Europeans whose harrowing escapes had led them to the United States. In addition to therapeutic social activities, the Scattergood staff provided health care, language classes, and job training, hoping to give refugees, or guests as they were called, a foundation on which to rebuild their lives. They wanted these tattered and tired people to feel that they were worthy of respect. Even if they learned fabulous English and they could work wonders with a hammer and saw, if the people had not found their own centers, if they had not rediscovered themselves while well, at Scattergood, all the practical training in the world would not have made a big difference. When you're under that much attack, under that much stress, I think your soul goes on vacation. You have to vacate your life, your biography, your body, just to survive. At Scattergood Hostel, uh, people's souls, people's spirits could rejoin their bodies, the biographies. People could rest. The Quakers intended this a place to be where people could regather themselves, and indeed that's what happened. Of the 23 children who passed through Scattergood, all but three became either teachers, psychologists, or social workers each demonstrating a desire to share the goodness found on the Iowa prairie. For the young guests, Scattergood was an introduction to Midwestern treats, like marshmallows and pony rides. But for 15-year-old Gunter Krauthammer, it was also a long-awaited return to serenity. After Hitler came to power, it was, a, it was a frightening situation, really. I knew I wasn't going to, I couldn't live in Germany. Uh, but you don't know where you're going to end up. So you, you have this, uh, this uncertainty because you don't know where you're going to go to school, you don't know where you're going to be when you grow up, uh, you don't know what's going to happen, and everything is always temporary. You don't know what to expect, and, and you don't make any plans because uh, there's no point in making plans because it's, everything is too unpredictable. So Scattergood made a huge impression on me, a very deep impression, and in retrospect, it sort of looms as a safe haven. I guess really the first one in my whole life that I had. And of course, when I came here, that was back in 1942. And maybe some of your grandparents were, went to school here at that time. In May of 1998, Gunter, or George as he's now called, returned to West Branch for the first time in over 50 years, responding to letters from these middle school students who were studying Scattergood as part of their Holocaust unit. So we had to sort of sneak out of the country uh, by you know, going through some backwoods and uh, crawling out of some barbed wire with the help of somebody who guided us across the border. And I was very scared, I'll tell you. As a child in Hitler's Germany, this New Jersey professor of neuroscience tried to accept hardships as adventures, even attempting to view his dangerous escape into Belgium as a journey into a new land. But despite his self-proclaimed optimism, the complexities of having a German Christian mother and a Jewish father were often too overwhelming to comprehend. They were all marched to the edge of town and uh, most of them were shot and the others were put into uh, cattle cars and brought to a concentration camp. I see my Jewish uncle gets killed, my German uncle, uh, of course, he survived during the war. I think it's important for anybody, or certainly for children, to realize that, uh, to know about it and to realize that such things can have happened and in a sense still happened in other places. Uh, and I think it actualizes uh, history to some extent. I think that's important. After class, a handful of students accompanied George on a visit to Scattergood, which has today returned to a Quaker boarding school. While most of the hostel's original buildings are long gone, the grounds still hold some of George's fondest memories, like the tree under which the 15-year-old refugee spent Iowa's hot summer nights, 
and the echoing spirit of the Quakers who forever changed his life. Scattergood somehow has meant a great deal to me, and I can't put it into words, you know. But it must have, because I, I've, I've constantly thought about it, and wherever I go, whatever it was, it was just a very unique uh, and powerful experience for me. It changed my life. In the beginning, Scattergood was created to counter the tragedies of racism, but ironically, it was racism itself that brought the hostel to a close. In later years, as the war in Europe escalated, it became nearly impossible for European refugees to find safe passage to Scattergood. The Iowa Quakers then turned their attention to Japanese Americans who had been forced into relocation camps. However, the West Branch residents, who had once embraced European refugees, now vehemently refused to accept Japanese Americans into their town. Unable to fight the town's protests, the Quakers were forced to close the hostel, bringing Scattergood's four-year path of light to a dark end. The following excerpts are from a 1940 pamphlet written for the purpose of giving the general public information about the hostel for German refugees established in the spring of 1939 at the Scatter Good School near West Branch, Iowa, and of outlining the purpose and intent of this undertaking. Among the early Quaker immigrants into Iowa were a group of friends, mostly from Ohio. They braved frigid winters, the mud roads, the almost impassable Iowa sloughs, with horse-drawn vehicles to be present when time for religious meetings arrived. The old Hickory Grove Meeting House stands on a plot adjoining the Scattergood property, but is distinct from it. It was built in 1865, when the Civil War was pushing friends westward. It is not without significance that one of the first activities with which Hickory Grove meeting was concerned was directed toward the freedmen, who in a very real sense were the refugees of that day. The sufferings of the colored people, recently freed from slavery and out of employment, now claimed the attention of this meeting. After a time of deliberation, it was decided to appoint a committee to open free subscription within our limits and forward from time to time funds that may be raised for the relief of such, as in their judgment it will be most successfully employed in relieving sufferers. For West Branch area Quakers, the community's existence was born in response to Friends' concern over the most pressing social issues of their time, namely that of slavery and the intense civil discord that arose around it. At the time, Southeast Iowa roiled with anti-slavery activity as several lines of the Underground Railroad crisscrossed the region with three stations in or near West Branch. Like the co-religionists across the eastern United States, Iowa Quakers also aided and hid slaves fleeing the South. Friends' fervor to find fitting responses to what they, as a group, considered to be the scourge of human bondage, ironically inspired two local brothers, Barclay and Edwin Coppock, to reject Quaker's historical pacifism and ride to Virginia, where they joined John Brown's armed rebellion at Harper's Ferry in October 1859. Edwin was later captured, tried, and hanged in December that year. Barclay joined the Union Army and was killed two years later during a Confederate attack on a train in which he was riding as an Army recruiter. Around the same time, Iowa Friends also focused on what they thought would assure the well-being of Native Americans. Said to be the first Quaker settler in Cedar County in 1844, Laurie Tatum was one of them to leave the newly organized Hawkeye State for so-called Indian Territory, where he served as an agent. A decade after he returned to West Branch in 1873, he became guardian to future president Herbert Hoover. Friends' testimony to giving religious belief visible form in the social realm, Elizabeth Gurney Fry to push for prison reform. Early on, victims of cruel and unjust imprisonment for their beliefs 
Quakers soon took up the cause of transforming what had been crowded, dirty, damp collective holds intended to punish alleged crimes and instead championed the idea of orderly penitentiaries where inmates might undergo solitary penance for any misdeeds, thus leading to their spiritual reform and later return as contributing members of the larger society. Of course, ideals do not always find full expression in reality. Many suffragettes in the English-speaking world were, or closely worked with, Quakers, including Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the Grimke sisters, and others. One of the earliest and most famous champions for the rights both of women and African Americans, Lucretia Coffin Mott, was once a pupil and later teacher at the Quaker school where she later met her equally activist husband, James Mott. She fought a long-held, friendly convictions. Soon after their founding in England during the religious tumult of the early 1600s, Quakers encouraged women to take leading, prominent, visible roles in the life of their communities. This was not happening in churches, synagogues, or temples down the street. Still today, however, women's roles in religious life are limited. This Quaker testimony to equality began already with the first founder, George Fox, who realized that even then, if there are discrepancies between different kinds of people and discrimination against them, there can never be really world peace, and Quakers were all about peace from the beginning, as shown in this document in the 1600s. An overarching principle that motivated, guided, and inspired Friends' myriad social testimonies, the Quaker Declaration of Peace in 1660 formed a pillar of Quaker thought and life for the next four centuries. William Penn tapped upon core Quaker principles some 20 years later when he founded a colony the king named for his father, to whom the crown owned a great debt. The younger Penn used this land grant as a refuge of religious freedom for all. Friends soon felt that the time had arrived when they must provide better facilities for the religious education of their children and youth. This concern resulted in the opening of the Scattergood Boarding School in the fall of 1890. The name Scattergood arose from a Philadelphia friend by that name who, visiting the Quakers here, sensed the need of such a school and gave several thousand dollars to assist in its establishment. By the close of the year 1931, changed conditions, financial depression, and other causes had so reduced the support of the school and money and students that it seemed best to discontinue the school operation. During the years since the close of the school, there had been a growing concern in the minds of many friends to find some commendable use and service for the idle property that would render it an asset to a good cause instead of a liability. Well, it might appear to be a liability, however, can, under shifting circumstances, suddenly turn into an asset which no one before had ever imagined. At the Young Friends Conference held at Clear Lake in 1938, this feeling found vocal expression in the starting of a movement to bring the situation to the notice of the American Friends Service Committee, whose headquarters are in Philadelphia. It all seems so improbable now, but indeed, a local grassroots initiative by Quaker youth, wedded with American Friends' most venerable relief and reform agency, resulted in a singularly innovative and effective safe haven for victims of Nazi hate and aggression. For its peace work and wartime activities during World War II, the American Friends Service Committee, along with the British Friends Service Committee, was awarded the distinctive Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. Over its existence of more than a century, the AFSC has been active in many fields, international peace, hunger relief, refugee relief, but also civil rights, which took some surprising turns in the story of Bayard Rustin. Significantly, Bayard Rustin, who was raised by his Quaker grandparents with a lot of influence from his grandmother, he went on to become extremely important in the Quaker nonviolent movement, as well as the African-American civil rights movement separate from Quakers. There was, of course, this bleeding over between the two. It was Bayard Rustin who, almost single-handedly, in effect, organized the 1963 March on Washington, where Martin Luther King Jr., his colleague, his protege, gave the famous I Have a Dream speech. 
Unfortunately, because he was homosexual, other African Americans in the civil rights movement avoided him, blacklisted him, ghosted him, and his story sort of withered on the vine. It was only in the last 10 years or so that even Quakers began to talk about him, and then there was this jump over from the Quaker cultural scene to the American scene. But indeed, Bayard Rustin was important, and in more ways than one. But back to Clear Lake, specifically to that summer young friends gathering him at his camp. My mother and I attended as teenagers decades later, fully unaware that on that same shore, young Quakers once sat around and dreamt of a project that eventually would offer new leases on life for 185 dejected Europeans. After correspondence and committee meetings, the AFC sent representatives to look into the practicability of the proposed project. After receiving a favorable report, the committee drew up an outline of the conditions under which they could use the premises as a hostel for German refugees. What strikes me both as an Iowa farm boy long ago and as a social historian is that right away in Clarence Pickett's first page of his 1938 notes to that funding delegation trip, his comments about German landscapes and agriculture. He notes the quality of farmland in northern Germany, then tellingly the next sentence mentions the Hitler regime's massive militarization. Why? In 1938, the United States, as well as much of the rest of the industrialized world, was still wrestling with the fallout almost a decade earlier of Wall Street's crash, of the collapse of the capitalist system. In that social climate, not only were jobs truly scarce, but centrists and progressives distrusted a return to business-as-usual urban, industrial, free-market culture as a solution to all that might ail a people. Thus, most Quakers supported removing refugees from urban areas and trying to resettle them at least in small cities and towns, if not directly, on acreages. Not only did the Nazis once consider forcing four million European Jews to live on the faraway African island of Madagascar, but even Jewish relief agencies attempted to establish agricultural communities for Jewish refugees. The American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and Refugee Aid, for one, established a large one at Sasua in the Dominican Republic, while the Quakers ran the smaller Finca Paso Seco outside Havana, Cuba. But going from the Caribbean, Pampa, back to the Iowa prairies. This plan was approved by the representative meeting in Iowa, and plans for the actual establishment of the hostel began to go forward. The American Friends Service Committee had been looking for a place where newcomers to this country could go for a few weeks or months to recover from the effects of their recent experiences. And those experiences had been hard ones, indeed, as shown in the faces of these German Jews being deported from Würzburg in April 1942. Regain their confidence, improve their English, learn to drive a car, and if need be, start retraining themselves for some new line of work before seeking a permanent place in American society. An all-year project was needed, some distance from the thickly populated Atlantic seaboard, where all the problems of unemployment and assimilation are disproportionately serious. For the two job placement directors of Scattergood, the hostel's rural location was key. For too much of the Great Depression, one-fourth of all working Americans were unemployed, in worst-hit areas a third. As the hostel was being established, rearmament had not yet ended mass joblessness. Assimilation was also a delicate issue, as many East Coast urbanites were complaining about the high percentage of immigrants, especially of refugees, arriving among them. A Midwestern rural community seemed best fitted for such an enterprise, not too far from cities, colleges, schools, shops, factories, yet out in the country where a generous garden could take care of much of the food supply and offer possibilities for agricultural experience. Again, the Quakers wanted to accentuate all agrarian activities. That's why they talked about the agrarian agricultural experience. If it could also be in a community friendly to the ideals and purposes of the Society of Friends, so that a particular point of view could be assured in the handling of human problems, so much the better. Scattergood School seemed to possess these potentialities to a high degree. The general care of the grounds will be the responsibility of Walter and Sarah Stanley, who were the superintendents during the last year of school and have been the very efficient caretakers of the premises since that time. 
They have the care and general oversight of the plant, campus, flower beds, shrubbery, and gardening operations. Scatterglib was being made habitable, but more than that. The social, educational, and spiritual mission of the new Scattergood had begun to shape and polish people of potential value for American life through the agency of a common task. Teach them new skills and the attitudes to go with them. And share in this human venture the volunteer staff did. The household dietitian, Lillian Pemberton for one, grew up on her family's farm a half mile from Scattergood at Yankee Corner. When a University of Iowa political science graduate student, George Willoughby, came once for a tour of the hostel, it impressed him so much that he joined the staff. Evidently, Lillian impressed him too because a short time later they married, a union which generated social activist involvement for the rest of their shared lives. While Lillian was local, George had grown up in Panama, the son of an American engineer. His self-described rebelliousness, however, got him kicked out of the canal zone. Introduce them to the new world about them and then send them forth to make their way. Part Danforth had left the East Coast expressly to find initial placements for the New Americans, as they were often called at the time, across the Midwest. He remained friends with many of them for the rest of his life. The New Scatter Good has an exceedingly rich and growing mission. There are accommodations for about 35 or 40 Germans and 10 Americans, among the latter a number of young volunteers eager to share in this human venture. Similarly, Robert Berquist had read an article about Scattergood and asked if he could volunteer for two weeks during his vacation, which he did. Upon returning to his native Minnesota, he quit his job, surrendered his apartment, and returned to Scattergood to work with refugees for a year and a half. Until, that is, the draft board refused his request to continue working with them and instead assigned him to work on reservations with disturbed Native American children or plant trees in the West. After the war, Robert returned to Scattergood, where he and his wife, Sarah, a nurse, spent the rest of their lives on staff of the reopened school. It was at a Quaker gathering in Iowa, to be exact, in the lunch line during a conference that Robert told a young and aspiring historian about the refugees, a casual reference that would change both their lives, lead to a PBS feature and a dissertation, a book, and hundreds of presentations about the inspiring events of Scattergood. But I will tell that story at the end of this film. It will be a shifting household, Guests will come there to rest and to learn, to receive and to give. Then, when they are ready to move out into some community that needs what they can offer, others will take their places. Men from Vienna, Berlin, Prague and Pennsylvania. Jeweler, exporter, statistical expert, merchant, student, all rubbing elbows in a common task. Scattergood will become the center of much striving expectancy and of many touching, yet heroic human adjustments, if it is to perform its real function. It seems now, in retrospect, that Scattergood's real function was to be a meeting place for hundreds of people, of grannies and babies, of farmers and bankers, of Jews and Quakers, teachers and students, journalists and celebrities, visitors like Grant Wood and the Von Trapp family singers, wartime hawks and passing by gawkers. So came the word, one April day, and the staff workers in the office in Philadelphia soon found six men who were ready to go. Four Germans, a Czech, and an American. They fared forth on Wednesday, 12 April 1939, in a station wagon with John E. Kaltenbach of Royersford, Pennsylvania, at the wheel. The rate of such encounters quickened as of April 1939, when those first five men, a sixth Georg Lauri from Hamburg, arrived the next day via train, were an assorted lot. Kurt Rosek, a Viennese junior, Kurt Schaefer, a statistical mathematician from Berlin, stateless Karl Gamm of Prague, who had been studying Philadelphia when the Nazis occupied Czechoslovakia. Later, a theology student, Quaker John Kaltenbach, who became the hostel's second director by default, and the first one, appointee Robert Martin, swiftly utterly failed, and Viennese stationer Fritz Treuer. Except for the Quaker host and the Catholic Gamm, all of the men were either practicing Jews or informed by the Nazis that they had, quote, too much Jewish blood to be Aryans, enough terrifying uncertainty by Hitler and his henchmen to scatter them in every direction of the winds. American men do not click their heels and bow ever so slightly when they shake hands. They find it no affront to their dignity to cut grass, tend the baby, or put on an apron and wipe the dishes. Despite their diverse origins and disparate journeys that brought each of them to West Branch, 
On the evening of their arrival, the Iowa Quakers did what they normally would do to mark most social events, have a potluck. Already there and then, the men launched upon the unending process of adapting to a new world and the forming of lives they didn't know they'd eventually build there. These things can best be taught by contagion, hence the need for as many American contacts as possible. Cross-cultural encounters are great, in theory, but in practice they can be jarring, as apparent in local Quaker Guthrie Taylor's body language while talking with two of the arrivees. Perhaps sensing some tension silently swirling around the room, Carl Gamm eventually found a fiddle and began playing, perhaps longing tunes from his bohemian homeland. Our American folkways are not always the best folkways, but they are ours, and a certain amount of conformity has its value for the newcomer. Already upon arriving in America, the refugees began to wade into the mysterious new game of baseball, and many of them anglicized their names, for example, Georg, now George Lowry, who jettisoned not only the German pronunciation of his name, but also chic European travel garb for American working man jeans. The following Monday, they started work. They scraped and painted walls, sanded floors, washed windows, planted corn. The first family to come were the Deutsch family, Amo Regina and the children Michael and Hannah. They had just left Vienna with his horrific scenes of Jews being forced to wash the sidewalks with toothbrushes. And of course, then Viennese Jews stood along lines at Polish and other embassies to get visas out anywhere but to stay there. Other families who arrived at Skadugut often did so in stages, as with the Seligmans. The father, Sigmund, came to America first, and sent for his wife, Friedel, and their daughter, Ilse, who they promptly renamed Elizabeth because her mother feared she'd be confused with the cow and the board and dairy products advertisements, Elsie the cow. Like his father, Helmut also didn't stay long-term at the hostel, but rather joined his family there, having long been separated from them as one of the 10,000 so-called non-Aryan children invited to Britain by the German Emergency Committee of the Religious Society of Friends, as Quakers have formerly known. Those kinder transports of 10,000 children did not take place en masse, all at once in a central location, but rather in small numbers scattered around Nazi-occupied Europe in far-flung places like in Vienna or here at the Prague airport. A butcher and cattle dealer in Neustadt, Gusweiler sensed the urgency to flee the spreading Nazi terror even before he had the funds to bring his wife Rosel and their five-year-old daughter Bertel. So he took a ship from Bremen to New York, where he arrived on the 31st of August, 1939, unwittingly on the last day before World War II began. By the time he finally got passage money for his wife and little girl, however, the war in Western Europe had become so intense that the two took a train from Berlin to Vilnius and another to pre-invasion Moscow, where Quakers gave them new tickets via Vladivostok to Seoul, Korea. Taking a boat to Japan, then a ship from there to Seattle, they boarded a Greyhound to Iowa, and then finally, the three road-weary Weilers were reunited at Scattergood Hostel on 26 August 1940, just shy of a year since they had been separated. Their family's attempts to flee Nazi-occupied Europe ended far less happily. That of St. Petersburg native Boris Jaffa, who said he was Eastern Orthodox, but of Jewish descent, had fought for the Tsar during the First World War, until being held a prisoner of war in Germany. As the Bolsheviks overran Tsarist Russia, Boris opted to migrate to turbulent Berlin rather than return to his native land, now inflamed by civil war. In the Berlin of the Roaring Twenties, he became the Warner Brothers Films distributor and married a Lithuanian Jewess with whom he had three children. Everything looked set for having a good life until the Nazis ascended to power. When they did, American films were labeled Jewish-controlled Hollywood decadence, and for the most part, forbidden. Warner Brothers kept Boris on their payroll as long as they could, but at some point, life in the new Germany became simply too painful to bear. It was then that the office agreed that Boris could flee to the U.S., then summon the rest of the family once he'd gotten them visas and tickets. 
Like with the Viders, however, after Boris arrived in New York, the war in Europe had grown so big, the situation so intense that all plans bogged down in endless letters and the securing of affidavits, etc. It did not help that the U.S. Embassy in Berlin had a covert yet comprehensive policy to keep as many applicants out as possible. For example, at one point informing Boris, in effect, we're so sorry, but we've lost your family's file. Please start the process from the beginning. Then, when he had almost reconstructed their application with help and funds from friends, in June 1941, upon the heels of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, agents swooped into the office apartment on Berlin's Heimannplatz, arrested them, and sent them off on an odyssey, which sent them to Istanbul, where they were traded for Soviet-held Germans, then found them plopped down in the Siberian wilderness, damned to somehow survive the Arctic conditions inside an inhumane gulag. Over time, not only did Boris's wife and children lose first digits to frostbite, then limbs to gangrene, but all save for little Tamara died torturous deaths from disease, made even more wretched by starvation. Only later did an English Jewish woman come across Tamara, now alone and traumatized, and somehow got her shipped to the United States, where she found her father, broken spirited and despondently sorrowful, working in a shipyard in Portland, Oregon. There, but especially her story did not end there, for she went on to become a Washington, D.C. socialite who eventually died of alcoholism. Not all the 23 children who passed through Scattergood had suffered the same amounts of hardship, yet each collected her or his own burdens along the way. One troubled young man was Ernst Solmitz, soon anglified to Ernest Summers, who made his way to North America via Paraguay on his own after the Nazis dragged away his Jewish descended, left-leaning editor father in Hamburg. In transit, the restless young man sojourned at a Hutterite community and on Native American reservations, becoming so anchorless that by the time he finally was sent to Scattergood as a last hope measure by Philadelphia social workers, he quickly latched onto an Iowa Quaker lass of his own age, 16-year-old Camilla Houston of Des Moines. Rejecting his proposal for marriage yet remaining in lifelong contact, the future social worker later said that Ernest's acting out was a predictable outcome of the trauma he'd incurred in the land of Hitlerism. During his time at the hostel, however, the staff had not been trained for such dynamics. Even tempered Sarah Stanley once counseled the hot-tempered youth to make your words sweet and tender, Ernest dear, as you may have to eat them later. Decades later, he and this story's chronicler met several times, including in Germany, where the author was writing a dissertation about Scattergood Hostel. It was by getting to know Ernest and his lifelong biography that the banality of evil of which fellow refugee Hannah Arndt once spoke was real. Ernest's father had been tortured to death while being held at Fuhlsbüttel Prison. Indeed, between 1933 and 1945, tens of thousands of opponents of the Nazi regime were imprisoned there, nearly 500 of whom died. Yet today, unless one knows this invisible history, it just seems like a quaint old building, one of scores, and thus we preserve and tell these stories to try to prevent them from reoccurring in modern times in other lands to other poor souls. That time, such unthinkable things happened to them, in this case of Scattergood Hostel, to 185 mostly but not only Jews, to individuals rejected by the Nazi worldview as unworthy of living solely f for how they'd been born, not what they had done. Among them were Gunther George Krauthammer, lower left, sitting on the floor, who featured in Iowa PBS's documentary at the beginning of this presentation, along with his father and mother on chairs. In the larger group, there were so many divergent individuals with so many rich, nuanced histories. People from at least a half dozen countries, Americans and Russians and Poles, Irish social workers and German members of the pre-Nazi parliament, merchants and judges, people speaking a plethora of languages and singing a multitude of songs, each one of them fascinating worthwhile in their own right. Yet if they too had been lost to the Nazi madness, the world would have been poor for it. Or more recently, what irreplaceable, irretrievably bright souls did we lose in the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge in Kampuchea or the slot of Rwanda, the breakdown of former Yugoslavia, or currently under the drones shelling of Ukraine? The story of Scattergood, then, is sadly just one installment in a longer, larger parade of senseless pillage and carnage, a procession that needs to stop. But only can when we, who passively tolerate or actively engage in such crimes, which are our tax dollars, stop sending our children to feed war machines as nameless fodder. This entire case study is full of examples of, as the early Quaker George Fox named it, oceans of darkness and oceans of light. But we must trust that the oceans of light are greater. To that end, we shoulder on. What became of the Quakers' experiment at Scattergood Hostel? What became of the refugees there? Perhaps the most important will be Scattergood's service as a center for placement. 
There should be several days of each month, which are commencement day for some man, woman, or family, which is ready to go out from this school into American life. But they must go out to some definite opportunity, to some little house or apartment, to some vacancy in a college or school, some empty place behind a counter, or in a community undertaking, some little acreage of land with a house, chicken house, a shed. Who is to find these openings? One man cannot do it alone. Many men in many communities must collaborate, organized perhaps, into a network of local committees. With one person specifically engaged to study the potentialities of these strangers from across the seas, and many persons volunteering to study community needs and opportunities all through the Middle West, Scattergood should be able to work for the good of all, for the upbuilding of handicapped lives and the quiet enrichment of innumerable communities. The transformation of Scattergood is, after all, not a business transaction, but a human and spiritual one, and its main object may well be the mutual enrichment of many lives by the mingling of the culture of the old world with the culture of the new. Through a technical snafu in 2016, about two-thirds of the 100 or so original slides from Trace's Center for History and Culture's 1990s-era slideshow were irretrievably lost. Tragic as that loss was and is, it's also a cautionary tale. Scattergood Hostel's legacy is too singular, too precious to literally go lost. You can help by forwarding this presentation to others or using it yourself in your classroom, at adult or youth education programs in your local houses of worship, civic organizations, or anywhere appropriate. Tell your friends, colleagues, and local history or other cultural directors of libraries, museums, colleges, etc. about the Scattergood story. Ask them how they might integrate this program into their offerings. About the author, born in Iowa to a farm family who had tilled the North American landscape since 1630, Michael Luke Trams became enchanted with history as a boy, sitting on the lap of his maternal grandmother, listening to tales of their people. This passion led him to attend a boys' school in England as a teenager, and to study history first at Iowa State University as an undergraduate, later at Goddard College as a graduate. While studying, he visited Russia, Scandinavia, Central America, Quebec, and other places. After two years of teaching history, English, and pedagogy at a Czech university with the Peace Corps, he moved to Berlin. There, he took advantage of the chance to see Israel, Egypt, Turkey, India, Nepal, South Africa, Vietnam, Indonesia. One gets the picture. Also, remembering the important legacy of Scattergood Hostel, he enrolled at Humboldt Universite in Berlin, Germany, to earn a doctoral degree, the dissertation of which formed the impetus for this book. Michael says, I've wandered far from my Iowa homeland, but I have never forgotten it. Thus the focus of this book. Scattergood Hostel provides an example of human goodness in a world hungry for compassion and justice, a model of how we might speak to that of God in one another. It shows us how to change the world literally in our backyard. Michael hopes that the events which took place at Scattergood a half century ago under Iowa's vast open prairie sky will inspire you too.